Hello and welcome to The Learning Lounge, iHasco's brand new monthly podcast series where we delve into a variety of subjects as we look to uncover opinions, expertise and experiences with our studio guests. Our intention is to provide some thought-provoking discussion and debate, which we hope you'll find engaging, interesting and insightful. In our first ever episode, we'll be going on a galactic voyage to Venus to find out how they produce such great leaders. Of course, we're talking about female leaders in the business world. We'll be covering what makes a good leader, the difference between male and female leaders, gender bias, and more. And to discuss all of this, I have two fantastic guests. First of all, we have Lucy Heaton, Head of Cross-Sell Marketing at Citation Group. Lucy, thanks for joining us. Hello. And Ange Wilkinson, Sales Director at iHasco. Ange, Hello. thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. So, t- first of all, to both of you, we just want to introduce you to our audience. Let's just find out a little bit more about your roles that you're currently doing and how you ended up in them. So, Ange? Okay, so I'm the sales director at iHasco. Um, I would say my role is to inspire and drive results. Um, and how did I land here? I came through through the sharp end. Mm. So life as a telephone sales individual uh, back in the day and work my way up through the ranks. Fantastic. Sounds great. And Lucy? So I work as head of cross-sell marketing for the Citation Group, of which I ask are one of the businesses within the group. Um, I started um, 16 years ago in Citation when it was one single independent business. Um, it's now a group of businesses. Um, and 16 years later, here I am um, as head of cross-sell marketing. Amazing. And you said you started, how did you start out? Did you sort of go to university and then end up coming? I didn't go to university. Okay. No, I've grown up with Citation. Fantastic. Citation has been my, uh, my, my life and my career. So, yeah, I, I came straight into a role which was junior, into an administrator role, no marketing qualifications. And, yeah, this is this is where I've ended up. Learned it all on the job through the years. Certainly and did. And it's incredible to have such amazing experience on the couch right here today. So, um, first of all, let's delve into our first topic. It's quite a simple question, I'd say, but also it can be many, many things to many different people. Um, the question is, what makes a good leader? So, Ange, what do you think makes a good leader? I think that that's quite personal to individuals and different individuals would have different opinions on that. For me, particularly in sales, I think you need to be empathetic. You need to understand that that's a tough gig and dialing out and people saying no to you a lot um, is is quite a a tough way to make a living. Um, I think you need to be able to communicate openly um, I think you need to have boundless positivity um, and I think you need to be able to build trust and act with integrity and honesty. Fantastic. And, you know, you talked there about empathy at the beginning, you having started out, as you said, at the sharp end and, and going through all that. How, how did that sort of help build that empathy for you? Because, of course, that's just years of experience of going through what those who you'll be leading, I imagine, are going through, right? How, how did that help you? Yeah, I talk a lot about having the locker room, as I call it. Um, so I think if you are a leader, if you don't ask anybody to do anything you're not prepared to do yourself, mm. I think that means that you can hold the locker room quite well. Um, it gives you well definitely my kind of style is what I call from the front so it does give you that um that locker room it means that people believe you mm-hmm. because they know that you've done it yourself so when you're when you're able to say try it this way mm-hmm. have you thought about this let's do it this way you, people are more likely to follow you because they know that you've been there you've worn that t-shirt and it's worked absolutely and um Lucy what about yourself completely agree with Ange. I think it's about, it's that adds that authenticity, doesn't it? Mm. If you've been there and you've done it yourself. Um, I think I've always worked for leaders that are very firm, but fair. I know exactly where I stand with them. Communication is really key. Um, the kind of, the, the empathy and that emotional intelligence for the people who you're leading. Um, you know, I've learned that from all of the, the, the people that have led me. Um, so yeah, everything that Ange said plus that I suppose and obviously we've touched there upon because you both have come through the ranks essentially, mm-hmm. essentially to become leaders um, there'll be people listening to this who maybe are being placed in a role a leadership role which might not be exactly the department that they've worked in mm-hmm. um, how could you advise them just based on your general experience as leaders on how they can maintain that empathy or build that empathy and trust with the sort of staff without necessarily having gone through it. Like you say, mm-hmm. and you were mentioning about how would you 
ask someone to do something that you wouldn't do yourself like how can you sort of show that to your staff and, and your team do you think I think it's a great question um it's all about credibility when you're leading a team in my view and there's lots of different ways to do that um I don't know who actually said the quote but it's there's something around leaders being um confident enough to recognize that they don't always have to be the best in the room um they that, don't always have the answers they don't yeah. always have the answers and part of the skill of being a great leader is to assemble a team around you of people that do have the answers so that your combined efforts mean that you've got all those areas covered so so yeah my advice would be surround yourself with with great people and empower them to do their best work yeah and for you Lucy as, as well yeah I, I think uh, you know a, a leader is a leader and I think leadership skills are transferable dependent on what the expertise and what the department and what what kind of team you're leading um I'm I'm not an, as an experienced leader as Ange and I think I'm coming at, at it from you know the people that have led me mm. and that's what I've seen exactly that people who have you know said you, you know I, I don't have the answers to this and um, but I've got a great team around me recruit for people who can do all the things that you don't do so well that you know what your weaknesses are recruit for people who can who can play that up um yeah yeah it sounds like such an interesting and insightful point is to recognize your own Ooh. weaknesses doesn't mean you need to be broadcasting them 24 7 but you're just uh, that ability to know when and when to delegate or where you need help or where you need to bring someone who's better than you at doing certain things uh, to the fore um when we talk about these kind of skills and attributes do you think they're the kind of things that can be nurtured be developed the things that can be worked on or do they have to just be innate kind of things or things that come through experience lucy i do i do i think they, they, they can be nurtured i think that um in my experience, it can't be learnt from a textbook. It comes from, you know, I think we learn and we grow from great leaders around us. I think if you don't encounter great leaders in your career, you won't become a great leader. Um, you know, you, we, we all we all copy and we all take little bits of what we've enjoyed or learnt from or felt good, what's made us feel good. Um, so I think it's I think it I think it largely is that nurture and that experience in my experience. Mm. Yeah. I'd agree with that. I think there's a certain part of being self-aware. So if you're self-aware enough and confident to know your own strengths and your limitations, then again, that kind of that that depicts almost a vulnerability that your team will respond to and they'll know when to cover you and you'll know when to cover them. And that's part and parcel of what makes a team really strong because everybody fills each other's gaps. Yeah, absolutely. That, make, that makes a lot of sense. It kind of leads me nicely onto the next point as well, which is an, our, our next topic being around female leadership. Um, and just to hear a bit more about, you know, your guys' experience and, and did you have male leaders or female leaders? Could you see the difference in style between the two? Do you recognize it now as amongst your fellow leaders and at director level and with your, with your teams beneath you? Um, Starting with you, Lucy, do you feel that there is a, a quite clear differences between male and female leaders? And um, if so, benefits of one or the other? I do. And I'm not afraid to say it. And I think we should celebrate both. I think naturally, you know, my opinion is that we live in a world where naturally women and men do have qualities that they naturally can do better, um, you know, as males or females. And I think we have to celebrate both. I think that's why it's so important that there's a balance and there's diversity across a leadership team. Um, you know, I've always worked for, for a business that has had a real good balance. Um, and I've learned from from male leaders and female leaders um, but I do think they're different and I think it's okay to acknowledge that. I think, you know, no no team of everybody with the same skills, as we were just saying, is gonna is gonna achieve great things. So Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. I'd agree with that. Yeah. Um at different parts of my career I've either I've either worked for male or females. Um and the style is in my experience very different. Mm -hmm. And the the experience and the impact is very different. But but you take I have taken um, things from both different yeah. types of styles. Neither one more preferable, personally, yeah. just very different. Right, and at the end of the day, you're the one interpreting, mm. you know, through your own lens, what the positives are of each and the negatives Absolutely. are of each. There will yeah. be negatives to female leaders you've worked under and negatives to male leaders that you've worked under, but yeah. also mm. huge positives to having both as well and, and what they bring out of, of probably what they brought out of you and brought out of the team. Um, 
you end up becoming sort of an amalgamation of all your of all the best parts hopefully yeah and perhaps the more generations that grow up with that balance of women you know and male and male leaders which probably wasn't the case two three generations ago i think we'll probably dilute that more and become more diverse as mm. As, as a generations yeah what do you think are sort of the most significant barriers obviously like you say we've made such big strides forwards over the last couple of generations especially the last 15 mm -hmm. 20 years um but what do you think are still the most significant barriers to female leadership um for me i think and you're right we have made great strides um, and I have had the benefit of working at other other places as well. So all great companies. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think there, there are some preconceived ideas that even though we've made some great strides, that we as a as as a, a company, as individuals, as a collective, even just as a as a nation, we probably do need to keep working on those mm -hmm. preconceived ideas. Absolutely, and Lucy, you you agree with that? I do, and I think we're still, you know, yes, I agree as well that we've made great strides. But I think we still live in a society outside of the workplace where it's more expected that women will be that kind of family person as well. So I think that the balance between work and home life can be quite difficult for a woman. It's naturally perhaps expected in society that a woman might be off when the children are sick or have to sort out school holidays and that's not the same in every family but I think that if you work for a business that's got a great culture that recognizes that where you've got flexibility where you've got you know respect for um the fact that there is a life outside of work I think that's where we'll continue to make great strides. So thinking about barriers to female leadership what would you say that both individuals and businesses can do to focus uh, focus on in a particular area to try and smooth out that path to encourage or accelerate that sort of growth into leadership for for female uh, employees? What would you say, Angela? For me, it's all about flexibility. Um, so, not necessarily gender specific. I think that employers will hang on to their best colleagues and their best employees by offering flexibility. Um, the pandemic changed so much for so many and now it's all about home life. Home mm -hmm. life is everything and your work um, is here to empower your goals at home. And I think when employers recognise that, it doesn't matter whether it's female or male, mm. it's it's around a quality of life. Mm. Yeah, and it seems that there may have been a shift, you know, in the last few years, especially to employers desperately trying to attract employees in, in, but with the workplace culture, with the flexibility, with what they can offer, those kind of benefits. H how do you see that, Lucy, in terms of um, businesses, what they're able to offer, the perks, and also mm. just the general working environment so that people can hopefully have that flexibility, right? I think you're quite right. I think there seems to be much more of a shift in in a yeah a, an employer having to sell the job to the employee mm -hmm. rather than vice versa. And I think culture. There's been a huge shift in culture, and people just don't stick around in companies that they're not happy in. That they you know they might get poor leadership. They might not be respected. They don't have that flexibility or opportunity for growth because they know that there's better out there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's good. It's good because it keeps companies on their toes. It means that they've got to always try and do better. And it, it you know, it allows that home work life balance, I think, to to, to to kind of be nurtured a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. And, and hopefully with more flexibility, the sort of focus on gender roles sort of becomes lessened the pressure is not on you know if there's two people at home to mm. choose between who would have to do yeah. what because both have the ability to be flexible that both can have uh, you know successful careers and, and be able to juggle home life as well yeah just moving on to our next topic and and this sort of more into the gender bias kind of aspect of 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 employment and how things have changed but looking back on your experience and your careers how have you experienced gender bias and and how also would you define it for anybody who's listening so they can sort of recognize it as well? And what about yourself? I've got a really good example of that that stuck with me for many, many years. Um, it was my first role. I was a telead, which was telephone sales. Um, and I have this vivid memory of being sent home from work because I didn't have my makeup on. And I didn't have my heels on. So I was told I wasn't dressed for business. Um, wow. And I was sent home for that. And, you know, it, it was quite humiliating at the I'm time. Sure, yeah. um, and, and I can't imagine a male employee have been sent home for the same, <laughs> no. the same crimes. Exactly. <laughs> 
hear the crimes against Jessica. Yeah. But it, but it is, it, you know, it's still yeah. it's, it's still a real thing. We can think of certain uh, professions where that is still absolutely mm-hmm. part of the dress code mm-hmm. almost. Um, so yeah, I, I can remember that one. Then that in a, in an odd kind of way, I don't think it did me any harm, mm-hmm. so to speak, because. I do have those professional standards and it's something that's always stuck with me now. Um, but yeah, that's that's one that I, I really do remember. And as you say, I can't imagine a male colleague being treated yeah. in the same way. Mm. Absolutely. And what about yourself, Lucy? Did, have you experienced, hopefully, not been sent home from work in that way? I've but... never been sent home from work to put my makeup on. <laughs> never, <laughs> interestingly. Um, that's that's terrible. Um, do you know, I've always, I feel like I've been very, very lucky in the business that I've worked for. Um, probably why I'm still here 16 years down the line. But um I don't feel like I have experienced much of that in my career. Um, obviously, this is kind of like you have the personal challenges where society makes it difficult for you because I do think there's still definitely a, a kind of society feel that perhaps women don't get that home work-life um, balance quite as fairly as men when it comes to having a family. Um, but actually in the workplace, I think I was thinking about this ahead of this this podcast and never have I really sat in a meeting, you know, around a table where I've been the only female or if I am the only female where I've felt like I'm the only female. It's not something I've ever noticed. And I think I'm really lucky to have been in that position, actually. Well, that's good to hear. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I guess when you look at the the type of industry that you're in um, and the fact that hopefully gender bias isn't obviously as prevalent nowadays as it as it was 20 years ago as well there might be some people listening um who are in very different industries mm. and, and maybe there is that sort of um division or, or that sort of bias towards one gender um how would you sort of advise them to deal with anything that they spot that might feel unfair um that they're sort of being you know I guess you could say discriminated against in those kind of in those mm. ways because of their gender. And um, how do you call that out? How do you call that out? How do you um, fight to, you know, to right that wrong, um, essentially? Mm. Um, I think for me, it's on all of us to call that out and have the confidence to challenge in the appropriate way. Um, so definitely as far as my team are concerned and and how I like to do things and how I like to lead, um, I am super conscious of almost being gender blind. Mm-hmm. Um, and if, if I'm not, then we have this really open and honest relationship across the, uh, my colleagues and my peers in that they can call that out. But my advice would be to challenge in the appropriate way and have the confidence to highlight that and call it out. And um, hopefully you're, you know, you're in a position like Lucy and I are that we're in a, a great organization that allows mm. us to do that. And, and is there any specific advice you'd have around that process, whether it might be um, sort of getting the support of a, a, a peer, someone who might be, have, be able to recognize that, find that ally in that kind of situation? Is that the kind of thing that you might want to do so that you feel like you're not entering into something like this alone? I think so. I think it's sound it out perhaps before you call it out. And that mm. doesn't mean to say that if somebody tells you that, that you're wrong, that it's not validated. Um, but I do think, um, you know, there's it, certainly in the business that we work in, it's not, you wouldn't need to just go directly to that person who's made you feel that way. Mm-hmm. There's plenty of other avenues. And, you know, I think it's important for businesses to to make people make those avenues known, mm-hmm. you know, speak to HR representative, speak to peer to peer, speak to, you know, so another leader within your team. If you have that open culture, mm. then people aren't afraid and it doesn't harbor and doesn't manifest and it doesn't kind of grow arms and legs. Yeah. Oof. Because it's not just about... Gosh, you really painted a a visual there for us. It's it's not just about gender, is it? You know, there's so much else diversity that we we need to be mindful of and we Mm -hmm. need to be respectful of. Well, that actually brings us really nicely onto the next topic I wanted to to discuss with you both, which is sort of the EDI conversation and and, and being able to build in more EDI training um, so that companies are very much more aware of, of all the different areas where they might be falling short and letting people down. Um, what kind of initiatives or programs would you recommend to promote gender diversity and inclusion in, in different businesses? So um, training and development obviously is really key for me. Mm-hmm. So we need to be mindful of, of religion. We need to be mindful of certain um, practicing Uh, festivals we need to understand that people are different and celebrate that um I think as well uh, again in the business that we work in we're we're 
hyper aware that everybody is different Mm -hmm. and we celebrate that. Mm -hmm. I I don't think that I can think of any examples at all where that hasn't been supported. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, again, depending on where you're working and and how you lead your team, it is all around um, talking about things, making sure that people are educated in the correct way and making sure that we're respectful and that we we communicate um, openly. Yeah, absolutely. And Lucy, the world is kind of full of a lot of noise, a lot of sort of stirring of different um, pots, which mm-hmm. which can sort of get people to feel divided from one another. They can look at people who are different to themselves, celebrating different religious festivals or, or sexuality or identity. Um, and they're sort of stoked in this sort of divisive kind of uh, mm. rhetoric. What it sounds like is that you're you'd be promoting and both be promoting this idea of of celebrating those differences, recognizing them and celebrating them as well, not recognizing them and being fearful of them, which Mm -hmm. is what a lot of the noise is. How do you sort of help, you know, your team cut through maybe what they're going back and seeing on social media or on the news with, Mm -hmm. you know, political speeches or, um, you know, comment posts, you know, from famous influencers who are, mm. who are trying to sort of keep themselves relevant. Um, yeah. How do you help them cut through the noise of that? And really when they're coming to work, recognize it being positive, celebrating people's differences and, and sort of helping everyone feel sort of included is, is the way forwards. It's a really good question. I think it's about education um, and open discussion. It's exactly what we were just talking about, about having the open culture and not being, you know, there's no taboo subjects when Mm. it comes to diversity um, and equality and being able to, to, for, for, for perhaps members of the team who do fall into one of those categories to help educate the rest of the team so you know we've got um Eid coming up at the moment mm-hmm. and we're doing a uh, we'll have Eid celebrations within citation um and I think yeah I think that open culture is really important yeah it offers that nice balance doesn't it yeah. you know if you're getting that at work and you're seeing the positivity at work then if you go home in the evening you see some negativity on the news then it's it's you're easily going to recognize whether it's amazing what you can learn just th- that you really feel that you should have known that you yeah. don't know yeah. just by having a conversation with somebody who's really kind of just peer to peer yeah absolutely um and looking ahead to the future what do you sort of hope to see in terms of progress if we're moving back to mm-hmm. you know the, the discussion around gender, female leaders um, in the business world, what kind of progress can we make in the next few years? Uh, what do you think is achievable? For me, I would still like to see more women in the boardroom. Mm-hmm. Um, I have, as we covered at the beginning of our conversation, I have worked for both men and women. Um, I've found that latterly, the more senior that I've become, um, I haven't actually worked for a woman yet, which mm-hmm. says that um, my direct report, my d- direct line has been men. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe that's just coincidence. Maybe, you know, maybe that's just the way it is. Maybe there aren't enough women in the boardroom generally. But that would be my, you know, I think we really have kind of reached mm-hmm. equality where you can look around a boardroom table and see a good balance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. see. So I've got a daughter who's 13 and I really hope that she'll grow up and walk into a world where she's not really having to have, she's not having those conversations about women in leadership and celebrating the fact that we've got equal, you know, measures of males and females on the board or whatever it might Mm. be. I I hope that she doesn't see that. You said the term kind of gender blind Mm. earlier. Mm. That's what I would really hope. I hope that it wouldn't be something that's even on her radar when she, you know, moves into the working world and she can go and do whatever she wants to do. And I think all the people around her, you know, the fact that I, um, you know, her mom has has got up and gone to work and gone and done Mm -hmm. whatever I've done as well as managing the home life. I'm hoping that that is going to inspire her one day, just the same way that my mum inspired me and all of the other women that I've I've worked for. That's yeah. my, my hope. I think the very fact that we have to report on gender pay gap shows that mm. it's a thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, the very fact that we, we ask businesses to publish those results mm. means that we've come a long way, but there's still some way to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and just before we finish up, I've got one last question for you both. This is very much advice takeaways for our audience um today what advice would you give to aspiring female leaders who are looking to advance in their careers whatever stage they might be at but they're looking to progress they're looking to build up and and take more leadership responsibilities on or move into a leadership role what advice would you have lucy um work for a business with a great culture Mm -hmm. Don't stick around at a business that doesn't have a great culture there's plenty out there it's competitive like we said this afternoon um and 
surround yourself with 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 great people in your home life as well as the work life. I think, you know, I think role models have got a lot to play in it. I think, you know, we've talked about male and female leaders giving so much, neither one more preferable than another. Ange and I have both kind of have said that today. And I think that works the same in home life as well. Mm. Um, so surround yourself with a real good mix of people, diverse people, whether that be, you know, male, female cultures. Um, yeah, and go from there. That's great. And Ange? Um, for me, it would be about what I call North Stars. So decide what your North Stars are and go for it. Give yourself time to course correct if you're following the wrong mm -hmm. star. Um, and don't give up. Just keep on going. Once you've got that laser focus on what you want, just go and get mm -hmm. it. And if you're not in the right environment f for you to thrive, mm -hmm. then leave it and find an environment where you are. Absolutely. It's not a straight line up, is it? No, it's all, oh, you know, no. There's often times where you have to take a step back to take two steps forward. Yeah. And I think, like you say, when being able to recognize when you're not in that in that right culture, in that right path, there's so much positives to, to that as well. And there's a lot to be confident in, in yourself about yeah. taking those steps. Yeah. And if you're open minded, who knows what you'll fall into? I never, yeah. ever expected to be never expected that this is where I'd be and this yeah. is what I'm actually really said, enjoying. You know, 15 years ago, this is the role that you're going to be in in 15 years. Wasn't on my radar. No. Yeah, me no. neither. Nobody no. ever goes to school or, or uni or th saying, when I grow up, I want to be a salesperson. Mm. Nobody ever mm -hmm. does that. You always no. fall, you always <laughs> fall into sales. Um, so for me as well, just picking up on what, on what you were saying there, I'm a real fan of what I call the squiggly career. Mm. So it isn't necessarily, a, a, you know, just one straight trajectory. Mm trajectory i can never say that um you know it, it there is there there are going to be times where you you know you fall back and then you move forward i think the key thing is you just keep on learning and you keep on going totally yeah. keep on growing fantastic well thank you both and that's a wrap for this month's episode of the learning lounge by ihasco Hopefully you've learned a thing or two about female leadership from our fantastic guests, Ange and Lucy. And thank you so much for sharing both your insight and all about your journey as well into female leadership. And obviously wish you all the best going forwards as well. Um, we covered some great points. I thought that um, in general, it's been fantastic to hear about, you know, from when you started out building your experience within the area that you are and building that empathy, building that trust with your team because of what you've been through and what you've learned along the way. Um, but also understanding that it's not a straight line up when it comes to the career and your path into leadership. And that if you need to take, uh, you know, the squiggly line, mm -hmm. uh, you know, journey to get where you're going, you actually probably find that you'll be stronger for it because mm -hmm. of the, those sort of moments that you go through, you grow a lot more through those tough times. So thank you to everyone for watching. Uh, if you'd like to listen again or share this podcast, you can by visiting the IHASCO website or our YouTube channel where you'll be able to watch and listen on demand. Thank you both. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. Bye.